We have two songs for you this morning, Too Late to Lose and You Keep Your Promises. Um, so worship with us as we sing both of those for you this morning. This is a newer, well, they're both newer songs that we have done, but this is probably my favorite one out of all of the mix that we've learned so far because it has a powerful message to it. So worship with us as we sing Too Late to Lose.
Dear Dad, words can't really express what I'm feeling right now, but I thought I'd sit here at your old typewriter for a while and try it. Because I learned something new about you today. You see, as I was digging through boxes and boxes of your memories and photos, I found something I had never seen before. but I never knew just what you'd sacrificed so that I could be free. I've always been amazed and inspired by what you were able to accomplish, but not until today do I think I've ever felt this level of gratitude. You faced your enemies and the very real possibility of death because you knew that someone had to. In the face of fear and uncertainty, you didn't turn on the fight because you saw that our freedom had to come at a cost. For me, for all of us. You understood that the deepest demonstration of love was to give your life for someone else. And I realized that all through my life, you've always been my hero because you simply are a hero. I know you never call yourself that, and it's okay because you never had to. That's what I wanted to say to you and to all those who served. We remember your sacrifice and we say thank you. Thank you for your service and thank you for giving everything that we might experience life. Gratefully, yours. remembering those who have went before you in your own families or in your own friend network or even in our church. We just want to say that we remember them today and I want to wish each of you a happy Memorial Day as we honor um, those who went before us and paid the ultimate sacrifice. So thank you for that. Thank you for our families because without them we would not have the freedom that we walk in today in this country. Today I'm going to be speaking to you <clears throat> A new message is called, I am a conduit of Christ. I am a conduit of Christ. And um, looking at this, I'm going to open up with prayer, and I'm going to jump right into the word. But uh, turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 5 is where I'm going to be starting out at. Um, Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the word that I'm about to release. Lord, I know that you're doing something great and mighty through this. Um, this isn't something that I had prepared and it was a struggle to just get this out yesterday as you had a change of plans. But Lord, I know that it's a specific message for someone here today and for possibly someone who might watch online later. And I just want the word to go forth in the way that you have given it to me, Lord. So use me as your vessel. Uh, give me the ears to hear you. Give me the way to communicate it to your people, Lord. I pray that everyone who is here today, that you would have revelation from this, that you would know how to apply it better to your life, that it would open up doors and unlock hidden meanings in the word of God for you today, that it would be something that's going to take you to a new level of glory, from glory to glory. In the name of Jesus, we say amen. Mm -hmm. So my word today is called, I'm a conduit of Christ. I'm a conduit of Christ. A conduit is a channel through which water or electrical wires go. A conduit is a channel through which water, the Holy Spirit, or electrical wires, the power of the Holy Spirit, where it goes. A conduit is a person that links two or more other people. So today my question to you is, are you a conduit or are you a container? If you think about two particular bodies of water in Israel, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, they are both bodies of water in Israel, but they are both very different. The Sea of Galilee is a conduit. It's a freshwater lake. The water flows in and it flows out of the lake. It's a living lake. It is healthy. There are plants. There are vegetation. There are fish in the lake. It is, it is vibrant. It is healthy and it is flowing. In the Dead Sea, it's also called the Salt Sea, it's nine times saltier than the ocean. Can you imagine that? We're Floridians going to the beach all the time. I know that you've done exactly what I've done. You've gotten salt water in your eyes, in your nose, or in your mouth at some time being at the beach. 
and thinking about that and how salty it is, it's nine times, the Dead Sea is nine times saltier than the ocean. The Dead Sea is the lowest point on Earth. It's nearly 1,400 feet below sea level. And there's no outlet for water to escape. So it is a container. It holds water until it evaporates. So that means that the Dead Sea is a stagnant water area. Stagnant water means that it's motionless water. There is no motion, there is no current. It's not flowing into a stream, it's not flowing into a river. There is no current. And water becomes stagnant after it's sat for four days. After it has sat for four days, water takes on um, a, just a dead stench to it to where uh, bacteria can grow in it and all sorts of uh, just little critters can emerge, algae and those kind of things can emerge in the water after four days of being stagnant. Water can only escape through evaporation, so there's a tremendous buildup of mineral deposits in the Dead Sea because that sea has been there for thousands and thousands of years. So the Dead Sea cannot support life of any kind. There's no animals around it. There's no vegetation around it. So today I want to ask you, are you a conduit or are you a container? I don't want to be a container for the Holy Spirit. I want to be a conduit. I don't want to be contained. I don't want the Holy Spirit power living in me to be contained. I don't want um, everything to evaporate or be deplenished from me until all I have left is feelings of despair. That there's no power, there's no strength, there's no might in me. I want to be a conduit used so that the power of Christ can flow through me, affecting everyone who comes into contact with me. I gave you the same scripture last week, John 7, 38. I'm going to give it to you a little bit later so you don't have to turn there. But I know that most of you can quote it. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. I want what is inside of me to flow out of me, to touch someone else, to minister to someone else. I want the power and the might of the Almighty God living inside of me to bless others. I am a conduit for the power of Christ to operate through me. So I am a conduit of Christ. This morning, I encourage you. I encourage you to look at your neighbor, kind of nudge them. If you want to slap them around a little bit, you can slap them around. But tell them, I am a conduit of Christ this morning. I just told you, yeah, go ahead and slap them. Go ahead and slap them if you want to. It's good. It's good. I wish I was down there. I would slap some of you too. I would. I would. I would. So John 5. John 5. And this is a, um, a common scripture. This is a common story. We could all uh, come up here and we could all share this story, each one of us, I know. I'm going to read it from the New American Standard Bible, it's particularly the 1995 version. So John 5, this is at the Pool of Bethesda. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos or porches. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, Waiting for the moving of waters. Verse 4. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in was made from whatever disease, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been in his sickness. I've inserted those words. That's not in the Bible. A man was there who had been in his sickness. He had been ill for 38 years. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Verse 8. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. And immediately the man became well. And immediately and suddenly, immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. I want to focus in this morning on verse 4 of that. I want to focus in on verse 4 because in verse 4, in some of your translations, if you read the King James Bible, most of your translations, it'll be there. But if you have a new international version, if you have an English standard version, if you have the new living translation, a lot of those uh, old or newer translations 
will have um, this will have this verse eliminated and part of verse three. And so I really want to focus in on this this morning. And the reason why it's omitted from your Bible is because through research, Bible scholars have said in these particular translations that they believe that John, the writer of the book, um, was not the author of that particular verse, that there were handwritten scribes that would come in and it was probably an error on their part. It was an addition that was made after the authentic word of God. And whether you believe that or whether you don't, they're look and the way that they determine that is particularly the last four Greek words. And I'm going to point each one of these out to you this morning. But the last four Greek words, the New Testament is written in Greek. And so the last four Greek words are um, words that John only used during this one verse throughout all of his writings. And because of that, they, they think that this is not the authentic word of God. So it leaves out verse 4 in some translations. So whether you believe that, that's up to you to decide. I personally think that verse 4 is the authentic word of God. I believe that wholeheartedly. But I do believe that there are some things that are hidden in the Bible, and they're hidden in the Bible for a reason. They're hidden in the Bible for us to go deeper into the Holy Spirit. And how hard is it when we need healing, when we need to be restored, when we need to have something change, a miracle take place in our lives, we can feel defeated, we can feel like nobody sees us, we can feel like everything is hidden from us. And so I wanted to kind of dive deeper in that. And then when I looked at it, you know, numbers mean something to me. And four, I've been telling you all year long, four means door. If you go back and you look at the numbers in the Bible, numbers mean something. So the number four means door. So 2024 is the year of the door. It doesn't necessarily mean that a door is going to open. Some doors open for you and they're great, but you want some doors to also close for you as well. So just because you see a door doesn't mean, ooh, I've got an open door coming. Because when you think about Noah, you wanted the ark door to close. You didn't want it to open. You wanted it to close. So there is a reason behind some doors closing for you to take you to a higher level. But four is a door, and it's a door to hidden things. So if you think about it this way, hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. But healed people can be used by Jesus to be a conduit to heal others. So it's important that we examine this particular scripture and go deeper into this because Jesus is going to unlock the doors. It's like our healing is locked behind a door. If you think about this, a lot of times you go to a doctor and you hear a negative report and you accept that report easily. It hurts, but you just accept it. You're, you're like, Lord, I can't change it. We just accept the doctor's report. We accept the pain. We simply ask for another pill. There are plenty of people who are on blood pressure medicine, and if you are, take your blood pressure medicine. I'm not telling you to throw it away. But what I'm saying is, is if you are taking blood pressure medicine and you're not doing everything else that goes along with having better health, then that's a problem because you could... You could exercise, you could eat better, and that's going to also lower your blood pressure. There is a pill for that. And, and just because there is a pill for something doesn't mean that you should live in excess. It doesn't mean that, sh that you should continue down this negative path. But God is calling us to be disciplined this morning, to examine the Word of God and to go deeper into the Word of God. And with that requires a certain level of discipline. So never unlocking the door to our healing. We keep going. We keep going in that undisciplined life. And we don't really search out the scripture and search out the word and pray through to our healing. So there is a door that unlocks the hidden things in the word of God. What is behind door number four? What is behind verse number four? What is hidden will be brought to light. This is something that I pray all the time. Lord, show me what is hidden. 
Bring everything that is a part of your will for my life that is hidden, that is currently hidden. Bring it to life right now. I pray that over you. I pray that over your families because I want every part of the will of God to operate in my life, in our church, and in our families. It's important that we operate in the light and not in the darkness. So I want to look at verse 4, and I'm going to highlight some particular words. Some of them are just um, transitions and things like that, and I'm not going to go over each one of those with you. But particularly, the first, and, and here's the other thing. So verse 4 is here, but also there is a portion of verse 3 that also is left out of certain translations. So I'm going back to just that portion that is left out. So in your Bible, it should say, if you have these verses, it should be in brackets to, note, uh, to notate that this is a section that is questionable. This is a section that's questionable. So waiting, the word waiting here, if you go back to the original Greek, the word waiting means that you are expecting something, that you are expecting, that you have faith deep down on the inside of you, that you know deep down in your heart of hearts that there is a positive outcome because of your association with Jesus. You know that he will do what he said he will do. You are waiting. You are there waiting and you are expecting a miracle. You are not going to turn back. You're not going to turn around. But you are there waiting and expecting for a miracle. The next one. I am waiting for the moving of the waters. Moving. The word moving means to provoke something. To set it into order. That water began to move. Dead things began to come alive again through the moving of the water. If you think about this, think about Lazarus. How long did it take Jesus to get to Lazarus? He waited for three days. He waited for three days. He waited for everything to get completely still, for there to be no stirring, for there to be no signs of life. And then on the fourth day, he came in. So there is a stirring. There is a moving of the waters. Moving means that you are provoking or setting things into motion. Power does not stay still. When you have power that is moving through electrical lines, it is a, there is a current there. Power moves. It does not stay still. The power of Jesus is moving through us, and we are a conduit of that power. We have his power and authority moving through us. So, waiting for the moving of the waters. Verse 4. For an angel of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I believe in angels. I believe in them wholeheartedly. If you go back and you look at Psalm 91, around verse 11 or 12, you are going to see that there are angels. Not only in that verse, but all throughout the Bible. But an angel is a messenger of the Lord. They carry a specific message, and they are on a, a specific plan or outcome assigned by God himself to uh, take care of business for us. I believe that they exist. I know that they do. And there are ministering angels that go before us, protecting us, giving us strength, and guiding us to our destiny. They are pushing us all along the way to our destiny and to the miracles and to Jesus all the way. So there is, for the angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons. Certain seasons there means that there is a certain time, that there is a divine time, that there is a divine appointment, that there is a kairos time. In Greek, there is a kairos time. This means that it is planned and ordained by God. It's the difference. Kairos time is very different than chronos time. Chronos time is time on a clock. It is time on a calendar. But kairos time is when God steps into the chronos time, steps into what we call time in our life, and he says, I'm showing up today. I've got a divine appointment for you, and things are going to change. I'm aligning my timing with your timing, and I'm producing a miracle for you today. So if you look at that, that went down, the angel of the Lord went down at certain times into the pool, into the pool. A pool is a reservoir for, for water. If you go and you look at, in any dictionary, it's going to tell you that a pool is a reservoir. It is a storage 
a facility for water. It holds and collects water. It might supply a fountain, it might supply a canal, um, the city, aqueducts, but there is a storage facility. In the state of Florida, we are the pool capital of the entire world. There are 1.5 million pools in residential homes. Did you know that? There are a lot of pools in Florida. And so if that water begins to, uh, the movement begins to decline, the water dies. So there are companies that we call out to our homes to actually keep those pools in good working order because if not, we're not gonna be able to swim in it. So in other words, a reservoir is a container. It is a container. The water is going to go there and in four days it will stagnate and it will die without power, without movement. It will not make it to the aqueduct. It will not become a conduit. If you think about this, I don't know if you know where the location of the Pool of Bethesda is, but the Pool of Bethesda is right there, right there at the Sea of Galilee. And I told you that the Sea of Galilee is a conduit. And so the Pool of Bethesda was right there at the same location as the Sea of Galilee. It could either stay as a container, it could stay as a container and it could die, or it could move and become a conduit and live. It could move into the Sea of Galilee and it could live. Without movement, it was going to die. Without movement, it was going to stagnate and die. And it was going to decline and continue to decline until it was completely gone. And, and then once it is dead, it just dries up. It evaporates. But then you could move on. You could take movement and power and it could flow right into the Sea of Galilee. And it could become a container or it could actually become a conduit. So looking at that, I also noticed that pool, a pool or a reservoir or a container, is just one letter away from a blessing. If you look at the Greek word, a pool, is a, let me get here, is a baraka. A pool is a baraka, but, which means pool, a barakai, a barakai is a blessing, a blessing. There is one letter difference. It's changing an E to an A. It's changing a pool to a blessing in just one letter. You're just one step away from a blessing. All you have to do is just move, just a fraction of a move, and you are at a blessing. You are at your miracle. What looks like death is really a miracle in disguise. You get that pronouncement from the doctor, that death sentence from the doctor, and it's really a miracle in dis disguise because you have to experience trouble. You have to experience the stirring to receive your miracle. There is a stirring, a counterfeit stirring that the enemy will send at you. But there is also a stirring from the Holy Spirit that says, I don't care what the enemy has placed in you, but I'm going to stir up my power inside of you. I'm going to stir up every bit of the Holy Spirit in you, and you are going to be a walking, talking miracle. You are my miracle. You're a miracle, and you are. this is a season of turnaround for you. You are headed in the wrong direction. And you've experienced, you need to experience a turnaround. But without heading in the wrong direction first, you can't experience the turnaround. You have to actually have something bad happen to you in order to have a miracle happen. So a reservoir is this place of death. A reservoir should be a conduit for rest and rejuvenation and strength. Should be a place of replenishing. It should be a place to regroup and refuel and be poured out again. It should be a place where we go to replenish ourselves. But then there's a stirring. It says, and after the pool, it says, and stirred up the water. To stir means to put into motion. It means to agitate back and forth. It means to shake. Shake, violently shake to and fro, to set it into motion, which needs to remain still or at ease. It's when we set something in motion that should be at ease. Being still is being at ease. Being troubled is being diseased. There is dis-ease that can be placed on our lives through the stirring of the waters. And that stirring, that trouble, actually causes emotional agitation. 
There are our emotions, there are physical, there's our mind that's attached to it. So the next part of that, stirred up the water. Whoever then first. So whatever person got there first, after stirring up the water, that person stepped in, that person stepped in and was made, was made, was made. To be made something, it means that you're coming into what God has for you. There is a manifestation. There is a motion that's taking place. There is movement. There is growth. There is transitioning from one point to another. Whoever stepped in was made. There was a manifestation that took place. There was an illumination that took place. What was hidden was brought to light. The last part of this verse is all of the words that these writers, these Bible scholars feel like are not John's words. So from whatever, this next part, from whatever is that first Greek word, from whatever, from whatever disease you're going to be healed. So this is going back and it's linking it to um, the, the need for healing previously mentioned in the verse. And it says you're going to be healed of whatever disease you have. Your ailment, whatever your ailment is, whatever is wrong with you. And, you know, it made me think about, uh, you know, when somebody says to you kind of sarcastically, whatever, whatever. As your child, when you said, would you please go clean up your room? And whatever, mom, <laughs> whatever. And you're like, don't you whatever me. Don't you whatever me. <laughs> you're about ready to get in trouble. Don't you whatever me. Uh, but there are times when we have been experiencing such letdown. This man had been sick for 38 years. 38 years. Imagine, imagine the letdown from that. You know, from whatever. And it made me start thinking about how people will say whatever to you. You know, I've been praying for my lost loved one to get saved for 20 years. Whatever. Whatever. You know, you get to that place of discouragement and this man was there. He had been dealing with this illness for 38 years. I have been, I've had this illness for 38 years. Whatever. You mean I can be made whole? Whatever. Whatever. You're going to be put down or you're going to put down those drugs. Whatever. Whatever. The generational curses are going to be broken off of your family. Whatever. Whatever. And sometimes we get to that place and we need someone to come along beside us and lift us up so that we can really grab hold of somebody else's faith for a second because we have those moments where we get so discouraged by what's going on in the natural that we're like, Lord, I can't even see what's happening supernaturally right in front of my face. I know that I'm about ready to experience something supernatural, but the last 38 years have got me tormented. And I don't know what you're going through today, but sometimes that torment is real. It is completely real. And not only is it attacking your physical body, but it attacks every part of you. It attacks your mind. It attacks your spirit to where your faith is in that pool with you. It's not just your physical body that's dying. It is your faith that's dying right along with you because of everything that you see. So from whatever, the next word is disease. This, this kind of wrecked me when I started looking at this. The word disease, when I think of disease, I think of a chronic illness. I think of a physical illness. And it means that. It means a disease of a physical ailment. But it also means a disease viewed in terms that result in mental torment. Not only is there a physical component to it, but there is a mental component to it. I am diseased not only physically, but I'm diseased mentally. There is a mental component to it, and there's also a spiritual component to it. In other words, it starts in my mind. The illness starts in my mind. I don't mean it's all in your mind. I am not saying that. I am not saying that. There's a big difference. It's not all in your mind, but there is a mental component to it that attaches itself to the physical sickness. There's a spiritual component to the physical sickness. In other words, the physical torment is affecting every part of the person. It's affecting their body. 
It's affecting their soul, and it's, a, and it's affecting their spirit, so that every part of them is completely troubled by the illness. The third word, with which, with which, that demonstrates whatever illness or sickness. It's going back to that original sickness, going back to that type of sickness, and it's identifying it. And then that last part, he was afflicted. He was afflicted. That word means of some troublesome condition or circumstance. It is holding someone bound. It is holding someone back. It is holding fast to them. It is binding them or it is arresting them as in to be put in a prison. Think about being sick for 38 years and being on a bed for 38 years. That is a prison. This man was sick longer than Jesus had been alive. He had been sick and been by that pool even before Jesus was born, waiting to be healed. Sitting there waiting and waiting year after year. It was his prison sentence. So today, how do we become a conduit for Christ? That's the real question. How do we become a conduit for Christ? Number one, we have to expect things to be set in motion in our lives. We have to expect things to be set in motion in our lives. We have to believe that Jesus can and will do what he said he's going to do every single time. Amen. And he is going to not only uh, turn around things in my body, but he is also going to turn around things in my mind and in my spirit. I am going to expect things and I am going to move. In James 2 and 17 it says, Thus also faith by itself, it is, if it does not have works, it is dead. Faith without works is dead. Faith without movement is dead. Faith without change is dead. Think about that water in a reservoir versus a conduit. Faith without movement is dead. When you sit there and you don't move, you are allowing not only your person and your mind to die, but you are allowing your faith to die. We are instructed to move towards whatever God is telling us is our destiny. We can't sit and wait for it to happen, but we have to know it and move towards it. There has to be a place where I make a conscious decision on my mind or in my mind that this will change. Whatever my this is, I have to take a conscious, I have to make a conscious decision in that moment that the word of God, that, that the belief that I have living in me, that faith that I have received from God through prayer, through intercession, through just knowing that God is providing a miracle to me, I have to know that, I have to receive it, and I have to work towards the change. I am moving towards Jesus every time. I am moving towards my healing, and I am moving towards my deliverance. I am going to move. Without movement, water dies. People die. If you think about your muscles, without movement, your muscles begin to atrophy. We have to keep moving. Faith without works is dead. The second thing, I wanted to talk to you this morning again, just hitting home about ministering angels going before us, guiding us, protecting us, and strengthening us. When you are praying and praying and praying for breakthrough, I pray this a lot. Because I know that I know that I know that I need supernatural help. And I know that Jesus can give me that. But I also know what it says in the Word of God. So if you go to Hebrews 1 and 14, I'm going to show you this in the Amplified. And I'm going to show you this in the, um, in the Passion Translation. In the Amplified, it says, Are not all the angels ministering spirits sent out by God to serve, to accompany, to protect those who will inherit salvation. Of course they are. So when you're praying for a lost loved one to get saved, 
to say, Lord, I dispatch ministering angels to go to them right now, to shake them in their sleep, to wake them up, to begin to minister to them and witness the gospel to them, to connect them to people, to accompany them wherever they go, to put a hedge of protection around their life, to put a hedge of protection around their heart. Lord, I pray that. I pray that not only for people that I know that are that need salvation, I pray that for my life, I pray that for your lives, I pray that over our church, that there are ministering angels that go before us, clearing the way and making a way for us to walk through. Because what I want more than anything is I want mountains to be lowered and I want valleys to be made high. I want the crooked paths to be made straight so that I can redeem the time in my life, so that you can redeem the time in yours. In the Passion Translation, I liked what it said as well, because it says, what role then do the angels have? Because it's establishing, if you go back and you read all of Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1, it's establishing that Jesus is a part of the Trinity, and that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and that those ministering angels are below all of that. They're below God, they are below uh, Jesus, they're below the Holy Spirit. It's setting up that hierarchy. But there is a purpose for angels, that there is a purpose and they have a battle plan, that they have a plan that they fight out, fight out for us. So what role then do the angels have? The angels are spirit messengers sent by God to serve those who are going to be saved, who are going to be saved. Angels go before me, helping me in my destiny. They guide me along God's plans. They protect me. From enemy attacks, they bring comfort to me. An angel went down to stir up the water. That was power. Jesus was the power, but that stirring created movement. And that angel was sent down to stir the waters, to create the movement, to, to help people know, okay, it's time to get excited. Your healing is about to come. But the angel was there to guide. He was there to protect. He was there to comfort until the appointed time. Jesus was the power. Jesus was the power. The angel was there on a message to fulfill a message and to fulfill part of the plan. Number three, there is an appointed time for breakthrough, for healing and wholeness. In Ephesians 5, 16 and 17, this is from the New King James Version. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. There is an appointed time, a God moment that nothing can stop, not anything. No matter what you've been through in your life, no matter how many distractions or delays that you've had, no matter how many failures or restarts you've had, God will redeem the time. If he's given you a plan and a purpose for your life, which I know that he has, then he is going to also redeem the time for you. No matter what obstacle, no matter what hurdles you've been through, there is a redeeming of the time that is the blessing of God, and it's a part of the Kairos moment, that appointed time that you have. You are right where you are supposed to be, this very moment in your life. So quit, let go of the discouragement, let go of the rejection, let go of just everything that is holding you back from fulfilling the destiny and the call of God on your life because you are right where you need to be. And when you begin moving towards your destiny, God is going to begin moving towards you and there is going to be a redeeming of the time. Doors are just going to magically, supernaturally open for you. They are just going to open because there is favor all on you because you have gotten up and you have been obedient and you are moving towards the Lord. The fourth thing, I've been talking to you about being a conduit that the Holy Spirit can flow through. Allow the Holy Spirit to use you. Allow the Holy Spirit to use you. Going back to John 7 and 38, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's a conduit. That is a conduit. Allow the Holy Spirit to use you. The moment this man met Jesus, things changed. The very moment that he met him, things changed. 38 years of misery, 38 years of despair, 38 years of sickness completely vanished because he met a man. He became a conduit of Jesus. How do I know that? 
He became a conduit of Jesus. How do I know it? Because of what it says in the word. Let's go to, we're going to go back to John 5, but we're going to look at verses 10 through 14. Again, reading from the New American Standard. Verse 10. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. Then they asked him, Who is this man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? Verse 13. Verse 13. But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Verse 14, after Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. That to me was powerful because the moment that that man was healed, he became a conduit. He began telling people, I don't know what happened to me, but I know something happened. I know that change took place. I told you last week about someone that I knew that uh, was healed of AFib. And when you have a healing that takes place, and this is supernatural. Nobody prayed for her. She's sitting on her couch, and all of a sudden she just feels rhythm began to uh, just take hold of her body in a correct way. Instead of having that back and forth, that, that beat one moment and then not the next, and that awkward rhythm, just to have rhythm change and supernaturally come into being the way it's supposed to be by the throne room of God. She didn't have to have anybody pray for her, but she's been testifying to everybody that she sees. I've got to tell people of my healing. I've got to tell people of my healing. She is a conduit. This man was a conduit because he wanted to tell everybody about what God had done for him because there was a miracle that had taken place and he knew that Jesus was his miracle. Verse 5, being at ease with the Spirit, being at ease with the Spirit. We have to allow our body, soul, and spirit to be at ease with one another. We can't fight things going on internally within our minds or internally within our spirit. Rest and rejuvenation is important. Instead of feeling trapped, turn to Jesus. Instead of feeling like everything around you is disappearing, Give it to Jesus. You've got to release it and let it go. You have to release it and let it go. There is a sequence, a chain of events that for you to receive your miracle. There are related events that have to occur. A sequence is a particular order in which related events, movements, or things follow each other. They are arranged in a particular order. Or there is order that is established. They have gathered there together for a particular uh, reason. The sick were all there because they knew this time every year, this was their hospital. This is where they could go to find a miracle. Cairo's time was there. There was an encounter and Jesus was there to meet this man face to face. Linda, if you would please come. Miracles happen in sequence. You have to follow the directions of the Lord. The directions of the Lord were simple. Take up your bed and walk. Take up your bed and walk. Everything is turning for you right now. Take up your bed and walk. What happened as Jesus met the man? The man complained. Did you pick up on that? The man complained. He spoke all kinds of doubt. He spoke guilt, shame, blame. And you know, that shows you that there was mental torment also going along with the physical torment. Mm -hmm. It shows you that there was a lot that needed to take place in this man's life. It wasn't just physical, a physical miracle that needed to take place. It was also an emotional miracle. It was a spiritual miracle. Jesus looked at him. Jesus looked at him. And his mind was transformed in a moment. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will. His mind was healed first. That old mindset changed. He let go and he realized, I can 
be healed. In this moment, he let go of that old way of thinking and he became a new creation. He became a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if any one of you is in Christ that is grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he is a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Let go of the mental torment this morning that you're carrying. Let go of the pain that you're carrying. You can't be a conduit. You cannot be a conduit of his power holding on to your past, holding on to your pain, and holding on to the regret, holding on to the rejection. I testify of this a lot more one-on-one -on -one than I do um, just publicly like this, but my own personal testimony there was a very difficult thing that I experienced. There was a lot of doom and gloom that I carried as a child. And it led to a lot of emotional torment. And there were things that I needed to let go of, but I didn't even know how to let them go. Because it hurt so deeply. There was uh, rejection, there was shame, there was guilt that I carried. And all of that hurt so deeply, it hurt me to my core. And there is a place that you can get where your emotions are so stirred up and you're so broken that it will begin to affect your physical body. And I was there. I was there. I began to have uh, grand mal seizures. I had three grand mal seizures. Serious health condition. Serious, serious health condition. I had a doctor when I was about 20, I don't know, 20, 22 years old, look at me in the face and he said, you've got epilepsy, you've got epilepsy and you're gonna have seizures for the rest of your life. Just get over it. That's, your life has changed from this point on. And I left there completely wrecked, completely wrecked. It hit me to my very core. I'm thinking, Lord, I've got all this emotional baggage and now I've got this physical component too. I can't carry all of this. And thankfully, the Holy Spirit just showed me in that moment that everything that I was carrying physically was all tied back to the emotional jump of the past. And as soon as I began letting go of that emotional jump, my physical healing took place. And I don't know if you're here today and there is anything that you can pick up from that in this testimony, but your emotions, you've got to let the emotional torment of the past move out of the way to change your physical. There is a part of healing that is not just physical. It is emotional and it is spiritual. There is a part of your healing that is emotional and spiritual. It's not just physical. Spiritual healing until I was healed emotionally, until I let all of that junk go, I really could not have a relationship with Christ the way I needed to have it. I could not trust the Lord the way that I needed to because of the emotional junk I was holding on to. There is a place that you can go and you're so broken and you're so tormented that that bed becomes your prison. And you can stay there for 38 years. You can stay there for 58 years. You can stay there for all of your life. But Jesus is saying today you can let it go. You can let it go. And you can let it, you can release it. And not only is he going to heal you physically, but he's going to heal you emotionally. He's going to heal you spiritually. He's here to provide healing for you in whatever capacity you need it. Because this is your turnaround season. I told you last week that a miracle is nothing more than a turnaround. You are going one way and all of a sudden you do a complete 180 and you're headed in another direction. You're headed towards the Lord. And the Lord is saying to you today, I'm knocking on that door. This is, this. is I'm looking at verse 4 in John 5 and I'm knocking on that door and I want to provide your healing. But you have to move towards me. You have to get up and you have to move towards me and you have to release the junk of the past. You have to release the junk 
of the past. You have to let it go to find your healing. If you want prayer, come up front. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the presence that we felt in this place, Lord. And I just pray that your healing would hit this church, this family. Lord, I pray this community would be touched supernaturally with healing, whether it is physical, emotional, or spiritual healing. Lord, all three of them are being poured out from the throne room right now. Lord, as we look to you face to face, when we come into contact with you, Lord, and we see you face to face, let us surrender everything in full obedience to you. Let us let go of every past torment, every physical past abuse, every physical, uh, mental, emotional stressor that we have. We are releasing it right now in the name of Jesus. We are not going to hold on to generational curses. We're not going to speak death over our lives or over our family any longer. We are not going to speak death over our physical body because of what our parents, what happened to our parents and our grandparents. We are no longer going to do that. But we are going to walk straight into our healing. And today I, I, I command each one of you to take up your bed and walk today. You can walk towards your healing. And God is here. The miracle is here for you. Your complete turnaround is here today. It is for you. It is for you. God is for you. He is never against you. And he is saying, if you've got the faith, if you have the faith to believe for it, just move towards me. Just move towards me. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. And I need you to move towards me. I need you to become a conduit. You've been a container for too long. You have been sitting there and sitting there and sitting there and you're stagnant. And you're stagnant because you do not have a close relationship with me. And I'm asking you to go deeper and, and to take me fully as your Lord and Savior. I know that I have your heart. I know that you've asked me into your heart. But I'm asking you to go deeper. I'm asking you to go deeper into the Holy Spirit. I'm asking you to allow me to take the power that I have and to have it pour out on you in such mighty ways that your life changes supernaturally. That turnaround not only happens for you, it happens for your family. It happens for your emotions. It happens for your physical body. It happens for you spiritually. And then you're going to become a conduit. You're going to become a witness. And you're going to go out and pray. And that power that you are now carrying, that glory that you're going to carry through this miracle is going to touch the lives of others. It is going to touch them. And not only is it going to touch them, it's going to hit them in a mighty way. And that power and that glory is going to spread revival, not only in your life and your family, but in the community. Every area that your foot trod will be a footprint of glory. When you look behind you, you're going to see gold all over the place. It's not gold of money. It's gold of the glory of God that is touching your life. That you have become a vessel, a golden vessel that is full of the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. And I declare that over your life. I believe that is happening in this place today. I believe that is happening in the lives that we are praying, the, the people that we are praying on those prayer lists. I believe that healing is taking place. I believe that salvation is taking place. That God is changing hearts today. He is changing hearts today in this place. He is changing hearts. Lord, I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, right now that addictions are breaking. That addictions are breaking. Those emotional attachments to things are breaking off of people right now. That they will no longer desire the things that they are addicted to. The drugs, the alcohol, the pornography. That they are going to set it down. It's going to be set down immediately. And they're going to turn around. It's going to be a complete turnaround. A complete 180. And they're going to know instantly that they have been delivered. And they are going to walk away from it. And it's not going to be a hindrance any longer. It is going to be a complete victory. They are going to know that they are walking in victory because of the almighty power of God. And they are not going to question it. They are going to know that the power of God has hit them right now this day. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. I pray for your people today. I pray that we would be blessed. Going in and coming out, Lord, I pray that we would be safe throughout this 
Memorial Day weekend that you would just put a hedge of protection around your people, Lord, today. And I thank you, Father, because you are a good father. You are a good father. And you are a faithful friend. You are a faithful friend. And I thank you, Father, for the miracle signs and wonders that are operating through you in the power that we carry. Lord, help us to be the glory carriers and the power carriers that we need. Help us to be the conduit today that we need to operate in your power. In the name of Jesus. <laughs>